Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to the business case for openness, um, implementing strategy in a drawbridge up world. I'm the Economist business editor. Um, we wrote in 2016 that the, the political divide that matters now is not the old one, le less the old one between left and right, but rather the, the, the divide between people and politicians that want to keep their countries open to the world versus those that want them to be closed, that want to bring the drawbridges up. In Britain, for instance, Brexiteer politicians led the drawbridges up um, to, to, to vote to leave the European Union. Um, Donald Trump, of course, emphasises America first rather than globalism. All of this has an impact on, on business. Um, first of all, companies worry about the effect on sales and profits um, of, for instance, much lower levels of cross-border trade or sharply curtailed immigration. And they're also asking more intensely than ever before how companies can help societies sustain openness by paying more attention, perhaps, to a wider range of stakeholders than they have in the past, rather than perhaps simply shareholders alone. With me to talk about strategy in a drawbridge up world are four American companies that are household names. We have PepsiCo, PayPal, the Boston Consulting Group, um, and Microsoft. And first of all, I've got a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the, the main session. Um, in case you need it, Wi-Fi details are all around us on the tables and hopefully on the screen there as well. Um, I will encourage you to be active on social media um, using hashtag economist, uh, con business case, following us at, at, um, at economist events. Most importantly, I'd like to mention that this, this um, early breakfast would not be possible without the support of the Brightline Initiative, the Boston Consulting Group, and the Project Management Institute. And just to say a few more words about the Brightline Initiative, it's a non-commercial coalition that helps organisations bridge the gap between strategy design and strategy delivery. And I'd now like to welcome Mark Langley, who's the president and CEO of the Project Management um, Institute, to make a few brief remarks. Uh, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Davos and representing Project Management Institute. Um, I was thinking about the event and the topic of implementing strategy. So consider this. Research has shown that every 20 seconds, a million dollars is wasted due to poor implementation of strategy. So just today, billions will be lost. And in a year, two trillion will be lost due to poor implementation. That's nearly the GDP of Brazil. So it's an important issue and one that keeps all of us up at night. When I think about the, the research that, that's been done and others have done and the role that it plays, it's about losses. But it's not about loss of just revenue and profit. It's really about loss of value and value in organizations and value to the world. Businesses play a critical role in the world today from a wide range of issues globally, from sustainability to international development. And it's this capability to deliver value for the world that's at risk due to poor implementation. That's why PMI was thrilled to partner with Boston Consulting Group and others to form the Brightline Initiative, which is laser focused on closing that gap between the design of strategy and the delivery of strategy, because so much is at risk and so much value is being destroyed due, due to poor performance. Brightline is a coalition. It does its own extensive research We've identified in, in that research that 20% of strategic initiatives fail due to poor implementation. Again, massive value at risk and for loss. So it's important for us as, a, as an institute and as an initiative to help draw a bright line, laser focus on closing that gap. We know it's difficult to actually take an idea, put it on paper, and then make it happen in reality. I heard one, uh, one executive say before that a wish is not a strategy. We know that the dreamers, those that create strategy, need dream weavers to implement strategy. And finding that connection in an organization and providing the resources and alignment in, those, in the organization to deliver ultimately on strategy on a consistent basis 
is really the focus of the Brightline initiative, closing that gap between strategy developed and strategy delivered in all organizations, private, public, NGOs, because we're all <laughs> capable of delivering so much more value. Sometimes, as an organization, PMI focuses on finding excellence in the profession. But oftentimes, the best way to find excellence is to point to examples. So I'm excited to hear from the panelists today and their organizations and their experience in implementing strategy in a drawbridge up world. Because there's never been a greater need than today for openness and engagement. How organizations can do that, to ultimately deliver on strategy, is an important uh, lesson for all of us to listen to today. So I'm grateful again, thrilled to be here, and welcome. So I'd now like to, in, to invite our panelists to the stage. First of all, Hugh Johnston, Vice Chairman and Chief Financial Officer of PepsiCo, please come. Um, Jonathan Auerbach, um, Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy and Growth Officer of PayPal. Miki Tsuzaka, Chief Marketing Officer of the Boston Consulting Group. And Jean-Philippe Courtois, um, Executive Vice President and President of Global Sales, Marketing and Operations of Microsoft. So I think my first question is going to be to Hugh. Um, I think that for, for a, even as, as long as a decade ago, PepsiCo started um, a project called Performance with Purpose, which um, focuses on the broader needs of society. It would be great if you could tell us a little bit more about, the, the, about, the, um, about Performance with Purpose and also how, is, how it has evolved over time. Sure, I'm happy to. Good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, it's interesting. When, uh, when we started Performance with Purpose in, in 2006, the basic notion behind it was just focusing on financial performance or just focusing on, on short-term market share performance was good but insufficient. And by virtue of just going down that pathway, we would create short-term value, but we're at risk of not creating long-term value. And what our CEO recognized at that time was, in order to successfully create long-term value, you need to engage with the broader set of stakeholders that are interested in your company. So whether it's people focused on the environment, people focused on product improvement over time, whether it's your own employees and the communities that you participate in. So she launched this notion called Performance with Purpose that was focused on three things. We simply called it products, planet, and people, and had specific metrics around each of those characteristics that we said we would commit to delivering by a certain date improvements in the product portfolio, whether it would be reduced salt, reduced sugar, reduced fat, improvements in the planet around reduced packaging, reduced carbon footprint, and with people improving the lives. In particular, we focused on women and enabling women in developing and emerging markets to actually have better lives to, through education, through workforce training, to enable them to become more successful. And by virtue of them doing that, it actually creates a better business environment for us as a company. So we were at that since 2006. More recently, and this is how we know we have successful, we actually have a 2.0 version of it now. <laughs> and the 2.0 actually takes us through 2025. It's very consistent with the UN sustainability goals. And to the point that Mark was making earlier, it's not just about sort of throwing out strategies, but it's actually creating specific scorecards that we report on every single year as a part of our sustainability report with the notion that by virtue of doing those things, the financial performance will also come. So we, we believe not only in a broader engagement, but in being very open and very public about that engagement, because we believe that is the creation, that is the best driver to create long-term success. Thank you. And you personally have expressed the view, and I think this is probably the most radical and extreme kind of enunciation of this view, that companies should be moral compasses well, in society. I think, I, I think that's extraordinary. Please, please explain. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think in a lot of ways we can, because if we look to, to other forms of leadership, in many places, they tend to be short-term. Companies, it, it, I'll take a finance person's view, most of the value of a company is not in the first three years. Most of the value of the company is in the out years. So you have to deliver the short-term in order to stay successful, in order to stay employed, frankly. But that said, if you're not focused on the long-term, you're not gonna actually build the value that, that's being ascribed to you. I think in that regard, you have to have a long-term sense of where society wants to go 
And by virtue of, fulfill, of fulfilling that, you're more likely to stay around than do the things that society wants you to do. So I've coined the term moral compass to sort of use it as the divining rod for we ought to be able to actually lead where society wants to go by virtue of our long-term orientation. But if I could just ask a little bit more on, on the, moral, the idea of the moral compass, I mean, what happens if you know, other bits of society have their north set at a different place than you do? Yeah. I, I mean, I, And that's where I think actually a very active engagement model works best, because there are going to be differences in, in the way that people perceive things. And PepsiCo is a company, we're, we're a big global company, but we're also a local company. So we do business in, in most countries around the world. And we actually have to adhere to the social standards, the mores, and the regulations, of course, uh, that exist within those countries. So I think we have to have flexibility in the global approach to shape ourselves to the local needs. And the version 2.0 of performance with purpose, is that a, a, a sort of a response to a, a, the atmosphere of drawbridge up? I mean, has it, has it taken in particular elements because of the prevailing... I, I think more than Economic anything, mood. Per, perhaps indirectly, I think more than anything, it's a response to what consumers ultimately want. Consumers want to do businesses with companies that they perceive as good. People want to work with companies that they perceive as good. And as we sort of completed the, the first set of goals that we had out there, we looked forward and said, okay, how do we continue to stretch ourselves further? Because it, this notion of creating goals around the, purp the purpose side of performance with purpose is actually mutually reinforcing to driving the performance side. So we've seen success with that over 10 years. So we're now challenging ourselves to how do we do more? Mm -hmm. And how much of um, performance with purpose is about PepsiCo's core products versus other initiatives that are separate from the products? I don't know, kind of, you know, initiatives in local communities or sort of things that are separate from the from what you're selling. Yeah, I, I think it's a balance of both. I'm not sure I could good, put good percentages on mm -hmm. it, but it, there's, there's clearly a balance of both in there. And again, they, they do sort of mutually reinforce as well to the degree that we're selling products that are that are healthier over time and that are more recyclable over time. It's certainly good business, but it's also good for the local communities as well. And frankly, it makes people proud to come to work. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next question is to, to Jonathan um, of PayPal. So as with PepsiCo, I think PayPal sees your mission for good as, as being the core business, serving the, the often financially underserved in, in, in many countries. Could you talk a, a little bit about that, please, and how you see that fitting into societal goals? Sure, absolutely. Um, look, when we take a look at technology and the Internet and you know, mobile technologies and connectivity and what have you, and how that's transformed uh, all of our lives. It's, it's really quite fundamental. If we look at financial services at the same time, I think the real uh, potential of the internet and technology has not really fully been realized. If we look at the way that people move and manage money today, it's not that different from about 15, 20, 30 years ago. It really hasn't changed fundamentally, you know, uh, over, over that time. Um, and, you know, cash is still king in many parts of the world, and we all know that cash is inefficient. Um, the logistics of it are, are, are complex. It's expensive. Um, it's not incredibly secure. And if we look at basic financial services, the fees that people pay are incredibly high. If we look at North America over the last year, um, individuals paid about $170 billion in fees for basic financial services, and many of the people who were paying those fees actually had a hard time paying those fees. And so it really should be no surprise you know, to all of us that many, many people feel financially underserved by today's traditional financial system. And if we look globally, we're probably looking at billions of people feeling underserved. But even you know, in, uh, in developed markets, we see huge pockets of people who feel underserved in the US, for example. Um, you know, about 50% of families couldn't raise $400, um, you know, immediately to cover a family emergency with a car or health or, or what have you. And in Britain, I think almost 40% of the population doesn't have 200 pounds, you know, savings. And so getting back to some of the themes that you were talking about, it really is no wonder in many ways that people are agitating for some form of change in the financial status quo. Um, and PayPal has really uh, decided to sort of, you know, make this societal issue core, 
you know, to our mission and to our strategy as a company overall. We're trying to leverage um, our you know, global platforms to do a couple of things. I mean, our mission overall is to democratize, democratize financial services, but really trying to do two things. One is to connect uh, 200 million consumers with 18 million merchants safely and securely in whatever context um, they want uh, to connect, could be it online or mobile or in-app or in any, any context, and often across to the points that, that you were talking about before, across geographies, cross-border trade is an enormous part of it, so helping SMBs is absolutely core. We also want to use our platforms to help individuals move and manage money much more cost-effectively than they're able to do today to be much more inclusive um, in terms of uh, bringing people into the, to, to the financial system. And frankly, we'd like to go beyond that. We'd like to work with um, individuals and companies to give them the tools to actually not only be included in the financial system, but to actually enhance uh, their financial life. Um, and we often do that in partnerships with other you know, financial service companies or tech leaders or, or, or what have you. Now, to the point of how does that you know, fit in a, in a world, in a drawbridge world, or in a world where you know, there are uh, themes where things are, are, are trying to close down, or you know, we're all living within that context, what we're finding is as we're sitting down with partners, uh, you know, leading companies in financial services, or tech leaders, or governments, or regulators, or nonprofit organizations, and we're looking at trying to to solve the fundamental issues of the billions of people who are underserved, we see a lot of commonality of purpose, right? And that allows us to really align ourselves um, and work in partnership to try to really fundamentally address those needs. That's why over the last, you know, two years, we've done 25 different partnerships with, again, you know, some of the, um, uh, uh, you know, the um, financial service leaders like Visa and MasterCard and leading banks and tech leaders like Microsoft or Google or Facebook or others, but also in partnership you know, with governments and nonprofits. So would you say that, that in, in, in a sense, PayPal sort of serves the left behind in, in some sense and also many, many millions of SMEs around the world? So it, it is a core part of our strategy to increasingly serve you know, uh, the um, those that feel underserved by traditional financial institutions. And certainly, uh, it's a absolutely core part of our strategy to serve SMBs and to support them with cross-border trade. Fascinating, thank you. Um, Mickey, at, at the Boston Consulting Group, I know that you've um, recently put out some research showing that for companies doing good for society and, and doing well for themselves um, in terms of results is, is not a trade-off. I'd love to hear a bit more about that research. Sure. Thank you, Tamsin. So indeed, when we looked across the world in terms of the correlation between total shareholder returns, which we've been writing about for years, for as long as I can remember, versus a concept we call total societal impact, TSI, the good news is there was a correlation, although you pointed out that there was a correlation and not a causality, so we can talk a little bit about that. But indeed, if we look across sectors, whether it's consumer, retail financial services, um, oil and gas, you can imagine each sector has different behaviors in terms of how that goodness connects to performance. But we've seen a close to 20 point uh, TSR advantage for oil and gas, I think about 11 or 12 points in CPG. And in terms of margin as well, across sectors about 10, 12 points. So that is definite money on the table that I think corporations uh, can go after. But as Hugh rightly pointed out, this notion around performance with purpose, I remember Indra talking about it over a decade ago when it's based in the States. Um, it does take a long time. I think times when you had asked me, you know, is this a short-term or a long-term thing? How do different investors react? And in fact, for years, if you look at the investor community, uh, there's a study done by the MIT Sloan School about looking at 4,000 companies over eight years around does this CSR thing matter? And it really didn't come out as vividly till about two years ago. So now the investors themselves are asking for it. So that would be one sort of headline point that I'd love to engage in. The second point, uh, maybe building on what you, you said about you know, consumers want it. I think for most of us in the room, we're trying to hire people that are younger than us. So in terms of our talent and the next generation, this stuff really matters to the millennials 
and hopefully most of us in the room as well. And so if you look at the notion of corporate purpose and even corporate stewardship, um, this notion that we're doing something good for society and that is a corporate responsibility resonates very well. And again, looking at, I think, a, um, I think, 10 year study of looking at companies that have purpose that is clearly defined, that's not just a slogan on the annual report, but really live by it, and then connecting it to TSR, there was a 2x premium, which is even bigger than the correlations in, uh, that I mentioned in our current TSI study. So happy to engage further, uh, but those would be my two opening thoughts. John Philippe, um, so I don't think Microsoft's particularly been a, a victim of the tech clash so far, um, which, which is excellent. But I mean, of course, you know, the, the products that you're developing, especially um, artificial intelligence, I mean, they, they really are vital for the, for the health of societies going forward. But you personally, I think, believe that business leaders really do have a, a personal duty to, to try and do good as well as, as, well as good business. Could, could you expand a little? Yeah, I think, uh, I think I'm very convinced, and not just me, I think at the core of our company, that uh, doing good for a big, but also a small business, actually, is not just a moral obligation. It's actually a great reward for a business to become an active participant to the positive economy. What I'm calling the positive economy is where you got businesses, NGOs, governments coming together and finding creative solutions to address the bigger needs of society. And there are some big ones, you know, outlined by the UN, obviously, uh, by 2030. So when it comes to Microsoft as a company, uh, certainly, I would say the starting point in our case, and we are 40 years plus old company, we decided four years back to kind of refresh our, basically, our, our purpose, what we stand for as a company. And, you know, as Satya Nadella became the CEO of the company. We had a little bit of introspection as a company <laughs> to think about what is it that really defines us the best. And we came up with a few worlds, which is empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Those are actually pretty big worlds when you think about it. And what, what they mean is really that we want to align the best that we can do as a tech company with our people, talents, and ecosystem to enable literally every person on this planet to achieve more. That's a huge ambition, of course, and it's gonna take much more than Microsoft, many, many, all of us and others to achieve that. And to us, it's about really three things we try to, to, to accomplish. One is at the core of our business, basically what our people do every day across the world, is responding and enabling our customers, or customers like some of you in this room, to the great on the triple bottom line, to the great on you know, the people, products, and, 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 and all the processes that make sense for you to be a responsible leader. A couple of examples just quickly you know, in that, in that uh, space, uh, working with uh, the, the world leading water company, Ecolab, we've been building a, a platform for that company that, that is enabling them actually not just to connect their 36,000 customer systems on the water systems, actually connect that with uh, a deep AI platform and a deep, actually, machine learning model to enable them to get to a net zero water consumption across the world. That's a digital enabler of that company to contribute to the big water, I would say, a scarcity challenge that the planet has. That's what our people do every day at the core of the business. The second aspect of what we try to do is definitely team up with some very inspiring NGOs across the world. Yesterday I was actually uh, having a, a very nice dinner with the global shapers and social entrepreneurs. And yeah, some in the room, please, yeah. <laughs> great, great and exciting and inspiring example of NGOs doing fantastic things for people completely alienated in the world. Women, uh, you know, people, disabled people and so on. And you know, an example in that space is probably where we apply, as you said, AI to do good is the work we've done with Andhra Pradesh, a big state in India, 50 million plus people, where we tried to truly understand using, again, machine learning analysis, what were the root causes of kids dropping from schools. And that work is enabling the public administration Andhra Pradesh to truly allocate the money where the problem is, as opposed to spread the money in many places where it doesn't have any impact. 
So that's the second contribution, and we do that with 90,000 NGOs in the world, across the world, providing for free, of course, our cloud resources. They can, they can do great in their job, having a big social impact. And the third contribution, which we believe is critical, is being an active participant, helping shaping the right policies globally. And we are invited to the table, and or we are proposing, actually, some points of view. And we just issued recently, actually, uh, um, a book called The Future Computed Book, which is really about some guidance or proposals uh, in terms of defining some more ethical AI practices. And we believe that we all, not just the tech companies actually, but all, all the stakeholders of the society needs to, need to sit together at the table and define those principles so that uh, people are not just scared by the way AI could be not well used, not to do good, but they actually define uh, some principles that could be, uh, by which we could be all accountable uh, to, to do the right things. So th those are the three kind of legs we have in mind, again, in, in, way, in the way we think about doing good, hopefully, as a company. Jean-Philippe, could you also just say a little bit about the, um, the broadband project in, in um, rural America? Oh. I, think, I, I just think it really touches on perhaps some of the some of the sort of the drawbridge up voters, perhaps. Yeah, so this is an interesting project that got started about a year ago in the US. And, and, and the uh, starting point of that initiative, which is the Rural Airban Initiative, that's the name of this initiative, is really all about addressing and be, again, contribute to some of the biggest needs of uh, people who cannot find a job in a middle class, middle society which as we all know is a big problem, not just in the US, by the way, in Europe as well, all across the world. The middle class is growing tremendously from a de demographic standpoint. But yet, because of the kind of jobs that are being uh, needed by the economy, there's not a natural fit. So what we decided to do, first of all, uh, is, uh, is to help out with connectivity. And in the US, uh, it's interesting to understand that there's actually 35 million people who don't have access to broadband connectivity in the US. And we have decided to embark with some initiative with some telcos to use the uh, basically UHF unused TV spectrum, which is called the TV white space, uh, to build with some, actually some innovative services, software, hardware, and cloud services, a platform to provide high quality broadband connectivity to millions of those people in the rural areas in the US. And we've done that actually in the world in more than 25 countries before, in Africa and many places where you get a lot of that. But ironically, there was a big need in the US too. So we decided about a year ago to go and invest with telcos and start with a couple of millions of people, but really build sustainable solutions where telcos and others could actually provide such services at a very low fee and super easy and, and you know, accessible to even the most remote communities in the US. So it's actually an interesting one uh, at the core of the US, yes. Absolutely. So, so these are all fascinating examples. I mean, I think the, the reality is still that the, while companies may increasingly com be completely convinced by the need to, to think more broadly, there are plenty of powerful constituents out there in uh, financial services that do take, a, you know, that take a very, you know, take quite a critical view to these kind of efforts because they can they can expand, they can be fuzzy, they can lead um, heaven knows where. I mean, if you're if you're Unilever with um, with 3G after you, for instance, you know that's quite tough. So if you have a shareholder activist come along, if you have a private equity firm. You know, the, the reality is that they don't necessarily have a lot of time for these kind of initiatives. So I'd like to ask each of you in turn, sort of what, you know, how do you bring discipline to, to this, sort of, this sort of initiative and what, what should be the limits around it? Um, Mickey, can I start with you on that, please? So I think the key is to <coughs> be very focused. You know, you can't be all things to all uh, people. I mentioned, you know, the slogan on the wall of some company those never survive the test of time. So I do think, as I think you mentioned earlier and all the, the gentlemen on the panel, I think each corporation has a responsibility to stay focused on the core of what they intend to do and link it to business performance. It's not something out there that is unlinked. I think historically CSR uh, you know, has been um, 
not clearly connected enough, and that's the downfall. In regards short-term private equity uh, mindset or you know investors, I do think that they will come after you, and they will be you know looking for the immediacy of return on on on, on cash and whatnot. But I do think that they too will understand that the longer the surviving entity has to have a purpose because that is what will you know, guarantee the, the success of the future. So I think it is around having that short list of what you're focusing on doing. Uh, as the Boston Consulting Group, we have a certain percentage of our capacity to dedicated to doing this stuff. We're not a private company, but we're very happy. Uh, we're not a public company, but we're very happy to say these are the things we're doing. These are the organizations we're working. This is how we're doing good for the world. And by the way, it makes money for people. And isn't that a good thing? but we're not gonna spread it out to you know, more partnerships than we can handle. And I think that's where the disappointment comes in. But it also you know, gives a little bit of a discipline to the folks that are running these CSR programs to say what is the value that is creating and what is just an investment. The last point I would make is it's easier actually in times of emergencies and world crises. So you know, in our report we also talk about how corporations, whether they are in food or retail or logistics, if there's a crisis, that one is very easy to explain. Having lived through the big earthquake in Japan, it was very easy for corporations to throw their weight and you know, fix, fix the economy, fix the country. So I do think it's the non-crisis points of time and regular course of business and how you embed that into your business. And the slightly frustrating thing, perhaps, is that there are industries which you know, haven't, you know, haven't necessarily put a huge emphasis on societal goals and yet have performed incredibly well, the pharmaceutical business, for instance. I mean, do you, do you think that, can, can one look at some industries and say, well, broadly, they don't seem terribly interested in this stuff versus others that are, which are much more kind of, cons you know, d immediately consumer facing and, and depend much more on consumer choice than pharma, for instance? Right. So I think if you look at the sector differences in terms of linking TSI to TSR, you will see that biopharma, things are, quote unquote, getting better. Uh, the hot topic of the day, I think, is how you think about pricing in the industry. And there's, I think, a lot of very productive discussion and debate about what are the right OB zones to, to play in. And this whole notion of value-based healthcare, that it's not just the pharma companies, but it's the providers, the hospitals, the medical systems around the world around what is the value you're creating for citizens and what is the give and what is the take. So I do think that there is a new dialogue and it's expected. I think any CEO in this room will have a question from their investors about this. So, Jonathan, you um, you know, PayPal has the luxury of having this very much at the core. I mean, this, the, when you talk about doing good, you're talking about what PayPal does. And, and I think you use the word hobbies, perhaps, for uh, some other companies' initiatives. Would you like to expand on that a little? The dangers of having a hobby that can then just fall by the wayside at some point. Right. So first of all, I like that answer a lot that you just gave <laughs> in the you. framework, and <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> that it's absolutely essential that um, a social purpose is really at the center of, of companies' strategies. And, and at PayPal, I think we're a, a believer of it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a luxury. I, I would call it an affirmative choice that we've made. Um, and it was an affirmative choice um, because, you know, it, you know at, at some point, there, you know, there's this debate, um, is there a choice between you know, doing good and doing well, and, and in, in, in our point of view, that, that really is a false choice, um, which is you actually have to do both if you're going to have successful, sustainable strategies going forward. So our decision to make uh, a social purpose the center of our mission and link that with our strategy in and around democratizing, you know, financial services, uh, we believe is, um, it's great for all of our stakeholders. I mean, to the point that Mickey was getting at, you know, earlier, it is great for our employees. They're absolutely inspired in working for a company that's trying to democratize financial services, that's trying to make a difference for the globally underserved. It, it makes a difference for our customers, increasingly customers, and we're, you know, we see this particularly in, in trust barometers and the like, are expecting their, um, the companies that they're, they're buying products from to actually have a social purpose to, to stand for something. And we need to make that connection also to our shareholders because we actually believe that finding a way of cost effectively serving um, the underserved and uh, small and medium sized businesses globally is great business. And we need to deliver on that and perform on that on a regular basis. But you know, for us, um, 
there, there is no f false choice. You need to do both. Yeah, if I can add to that, Tamron, yeah. I, I, I really think that the investor community is starting to shift their mindset on that. And part of the reason they are is what we're more doing now isn't corporate social responsibility per se. It is integral to the strategy of the company. It's how we create value. So if, if you have to deliver the short term sufficiently well to keep activist investors and people like that at, at bay to some degree and, and not to give them a, an opportunity to come in and disrupt your strategy. But if you, <laughs> well, some, some choose to make you more short term in nature and you're trying to strike a balance. Uh, but to the degree that you are sufficiently delivering the short term, you then have the license and the opportunity to execute these long-term strategies that you know will create value over time. I tend to think of these things as very much akin to, would we ever not maintain our equipment? Would we ever not build new plants? Doing things around products, planet, and people, to me, are just as fundamental to our strategy as making sure that the assets that we have are up and they're running well. And, it, and if you do that, there's recognition in the investor community that yeah, that's a company that's going to sustainably create value over time. If you look at the, the letter that Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, just wrote, Larry talked about the fact that just delivering short-term results is not sufficient. A company not only needs to have a longer-term set of engagements around ESG, but needs to be articulate about it as a part of their strategy. Uh, Norges Bank has been famous for, for doing the same types of things. And now even recently, I guess Jana Partners has come out and, and called a question on, on Apple specifically around certain types of longer term strategy. So I, I think the investor community, and, and I, I hate to sort of simplify the investor community because there's a million needs out there. There's so many investors. But I think the investor community at large is recognizing the fact that the purpose for, portion of performance with purpose is fundamental to the company. It's not something that could be cut like a, a charitable contribution could be cut. There's recognition that it matters. Have, have there been, with performance with purpose though, I mean, what, what are the pitfalls? Have there, been, have there been some failures? Have there been some cases where something's got too fuzzy or ill-defined that you've had to stop? I mean, you, you, you've also said that um, companies should have a, a symbiotic relationship with communities, which I think really touches on the sort of drawbridge up sentiment. I mean, if you can sustain communities, I think that's incredibly important. Right. But how far do you go? I mean, do you, do you say, we're never going to sack anyone? We're never going to move our, you know, we're never going to shut a factory. We're never going to shut a, a plant or, I mean, no, what and, are and the limits? Yeah, no, and, and I don't think you can set goals that way. You, so, you still have to let the economics of, and, and the competitiveness of the industry drive your business strategic actions. That said, to the degree that you have to take certain actions, you need to do them in an, a humane a way as possible. So do people leave the company at times in a company of 260,000 people? Of course they do. Do we treat them very well on the way out in terms of retraining and helping them and trying to find other opportunities? We absolutely do that. So I, I think there's ways to sort of, again, converge while allowing for economic growth. You can't, you can't be stuck in one place. And I don't think anyone really wants that. I think what they really want is to be treated fairly and to be treated with respect. More broadly, I, I think uh, individual initiatives that have occurred under the Performance with Purpose banner, I'm sure we've had some that haven't gone as well as others. But broadly, I think there's quite a bit of success. And part of the reason there's success is we measure these initiatives very, very clearly. Uh, I'll give you a, a brief example on that. And it gets to the fundamental of how we run the company. If someone comes forth with a capital expenditure, looking to build a plant or looking to build a warehouse, one of the screens that they have to pass through in order to get investment funding is what we call the sustainability screen. And it really is the, the elements of performance with purpose. If it fails on those fronts, even if it's a good financial return, the CapEx won't be funded. So we've gotten down to a very tactical level after 10 years of saying, no, no, th these things are all integral to how we're going to run the business. We're not going to do a good financial thing that isn't good from a performance with purpose perspective. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'd like to slightly um, change the, the, the subject back to the theme of drawbridge up and sort of what impact, if any, that has really had on your companies. I mean, we've got, we've got BCG and PepsiCo, both who've had sort of slight run-ins with, with, um, with Mr. Trump. Um, and I think your, your CEO, Ms. Nui, um, you know, got in trouble for, for sort of reaction to the election victory. Um, so, starting with you, Hugh, I mean, is this mood of um, greater nationalism, the threat of um, the threat of sort of you know more blocks on cross-border 
um, movement of people and trade? I mean, is it, is it something that is having any effect on the business or factoring in in a, in a significant way into strategy and decision making? At this point, the, the sort of recent moves in, in the political climate, whether it's the US or what's happening in Western Europe or elsewhere, hasn't had a substantial impact on us. We tend to be a very locally driven company anyway. We don't move lots of things tremendously cross-border. Uh, our biggest interest is in seeing good economic growth around the globe, because if that happens, consumers generally have money in their pocket, and they like the convenience and the taste that, that we bring to their lives with the products that we sell. So to date, no. Uh, one would hope that we stay a relatively free trade world, and by virtue of having a relatively free trade world, we think generally that's going to benefit everyone. Mm -hmm. John Philippe, can I put the same question to you? Well, I think, you know, you know, in, so, you know, you know industry, you know, business, the, there's been a clearly a pretty strong mobilization of the tech sector economy when it comes to the flow of talents across the world. I mean, there's no way for any of our companies, uh, not just in the U.S., actually in Europe, in Asia, to continue to innovate if we don't have uh, an easy way to bring talents uh, to any places in the world where we need to, uh, to, to develop some exciting, innovative projects. So in terms of immigration laws, that's something where we definitely want uh, to continue to see a, you know, a positive uh, framework of laws across the globe where we can encourage that flow of talents to, to go and continue uh, across, not just with Microsoft, but with our customers, our clients, and everywhere in the world. So that's something we are very very attached to. I think the other, the other contribution I was starting on that direction with the rural initiative we're talking about is actually at the core of the skills challenge that you have not just in the US but globally in the so-called, uh, again, the middle of the society. And so recently, again, back in the US, we have decided to, you know, not to ignore the problem but to try to participate to a solution. And we've been teaming up with the Markle Foundation uh, and a newly created NGO, Skillful, to basically go after the people who basically have a high school degree but didn't get into the college and who cannot, get a, cannot find a job. And so we are basically putting together a platform where we are connecting the job seekers and the employers and using technologies, AI, LinkedIn, and other services to truly understand the strengths, the skills that define the people one by one. And how those skills and strengths could be amplified and could be developed with appropriate training online and coaching to get the job that the economy requires. And so this is actually $25 million investment we are making to, with other players as well to truly uh, make a change and also help out this community of people in the middle states in particular who cannot see the future. And so we believe that actually technology not only, but technology can help being smarter about supply and demand of skills, talents, and jobs in the economy. So that's another place where we believe globally there's many governments that should definitely use probably differently the funds they have with their employment agencies to get smarter in terms of supply and demand of people and talents. And so, yeah, so that's another yeah. contribution we believe it's important for businesses. Jonathan, is there, sorry, is there a risk for PayPal in terms of cross-border flows of money, for instance? Or is, it, is this really, I mean, is it a drawbridge up world, it, maybe it's more of a journalistic idea and the main effect so far is um, lower corporate tax and a, and a soaring stock market. Is, this, is there a real impact? Well, I mean, to some of the trends that you were talking about before and as I was, I was mentioning, I think it's very real that large uh, percentages of society feel underserved um, by you know the financial uh, system and services and, and and what have you, and they've been agitating for a change in the status quo. I think is that there, is very is there real. A regulatory risk? Is there a risk of um, of lower volumes in your business because no, of this I, I, this I, I, mood? No, I don't. I don't see a fundamental regulatory risk, you know, a, as risk? associated a, a, associated with it. Well, you know, we all deal with you know the environments that we're in. I mean, you can you can paint extreme scenarios that would have risks for all of us. But at the moment, I think the, 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 the business 
environment that we're in and the trends that we're talking about um, are, um, uh, uh, are, are really manageable with very thoughtful strategies. And some of the th strategies that we've been talking about are strategies that help the underserved, strategies that help SMBs uh, more broadly. But let's talk about SMBs for a second. Um, SMBs are, you know, what, what, whatever they are, they're, you know, uh, they're a lion's share of businesses in most countries. They are actually enormous employers you know, of people. So it's in everybody's interest in all countries to really support SMBs and their development overall. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about PayPal looking at our own base is that, uh, just look at SMBs in the US, I think the lion's share of SMBs on PayPal uh, do cross-border business. Maybe it's 75 to 80% versus you know, 5% of businesses that small, small and medium-sized enterprises that don't have PayPal. So we are really, you know, an enabler of cross-border business and opening up markets. And I think regardless of whatever country you're in, that's a benefit to your economy. And it's a real force for openness and that, it is that, is, that it's not, it's, that's not going to go away. Absolutely. Um, Mickey, can I ask you, I mean, I, I suppose the sort of the greater polarization um, of politics and culture is a risk for, for, for business in, in marketing and indeed in CSR type efforts. Do you, do you see it that way? I mean, is it, you, do you have to tread more carefully these days? So, you know, Jean-Philippe and I were comparing notes about how many times we've been here, but with the worst traffic ever in the last 15 years, you said, <laughs> almost 10 years for me. Um, so every year I come to this forum, I feel like the geopolitics are much more uncertain than business. So on the one sense, we have the easier part of the job because we are, are public or private corporations and are affected by the geopolitical infrastructure, and yet the business side of things, while the corporate death rates are increasing and whatnot, we have that flexibility to move faster often than the, the political side of the equation, which I'm not an expert on. I think as a business consultant, if I may, we believe that our greatest value is probably to bring the facts, the real facts to the table. And so in that sense, our business, I think, is thriving because people want to know. So your earlier question about the US administration. Well, you introduced me as from BCG, an American corporation. I actually haven't thought of it that way <laughs> in a long time. U.S. is actually you know, not a majority of our business. We operate in 50 countries, but we felt the need to serve. And so we brought the facts to the table. Immigration, <laughs> diversity, women, uh, where, to, where you know, the manufacturing cost differences between somewhere in the Midwest versus China and whatnot. And we will continue to do that. Um, and yet, I think there is a opportunity to help shape those discussions where public and private sector come together. So yes, there's a risk, and I think our you know, client universe may be split one side of the fence versus the other. But the best we can do is stick with the facts and see if we can compel people to do what we think is the right thing. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to open this up to some questions from, from, our, from our audience. If you could raise your hand, hopefully there's a... Thank you. And do, do um, state your name and company and so on first. Okay, thank you. I'm Elizabeth Rossiello. I'm the founder of BitPesa, the largest company in Africa using Bitcoin for cross-border payments. And for me, when I hear openness, I think of my sector, which is decentralization and um, open source APIs and open partnerships. And there's been some hesitance, especially in emerging markets, um, for bigger companies or companies moving in to really find a way to partner with these smaller companies or to really truly be open to scale. There's so much growth to be built. How would you do it um, without partnering with people at the bottom of the pyramid or SMBs or micro SMBs? So how are the larger companies in the world or your companies looking to partner or looking to be more open, taking truly open models to do all the growth that's needed in some of these emerging markets. Thank you. Um, we, we've, only, we've got about 15 minutes left, so could I ask our panelists to be, to be brief and to the point on this? Jean-Philippe, I think you might be very well placed to, to answer that question. I think it's a great question. Certainly, uh, as a company, very briefly, uh, we've been and we are very engaged in Africa, but beyond Africa, in, in three different ways. I mean. One is skills, so basically providing not just free but digital skilling initiative to millions of students in Africa. 
Two is really about uh, access. I mentioned the white space project in the US. It actually was born in Africa <laughs> four or five years ago. And with that, we've been experimenting some great business models for small communities, communities which actually didn't have anything, which created SMBs and, and, you know, and opportunities because of that connectivity. And the third one is innovation. You will find more and more incredible entrepreneurship spirit in Africa. Uh, actually all the way in central, western, north and southern Africa. And we participate in a number of innovation hubs and, and basically incubators where we try to provide again access to a broad cloud platform for entrepreneurs to do more. So that's kind of high level the way we try to participate to this exciting momentum actually in Africa in terms of innovation and access. Thank you. Um, any other questions? My question is actually more for uh, Jonathan and uh, piggybacking off of uh, Bitcoin. Um, is PayPal implementing blockchain currently and how do you think that will change the way we do business to business as well as how that changes the financial economy as sure. we operate today? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously Bitcoin and the blockchain are something that we keep a very keen eye on. Um, for all sorts of reasons that you could expect. We uh, actually one of the first companies that, you know, implemented an ability to process Bitcoin, you know, for commerce. One of the things that's been interesting and in part given the fact that that Bitcoin, you know, valuation has fluctuated so dramatically, it hasn't really been particularly stable currency, you know, for <laughs> commerce. And so the net result of that is it doesn't get used very much even though we have the, the capabilities to be able to handle it. Um, but we watch it, you know, very, very carefully. Um, blockchain and distributed ledger technologies are absolutely fascinating. Um, and, um, you know, we're watching how they evolve and we're experimenting with them, uh, particularly around, you know, identification and the like um, uh, cross-border. And so we're learning. You know, I don't think we found anything at the moment that we feel um, is scalable at the global levels that we participate in. But we are, you know, we're testing it out, we're learning, and uh, we're very interested in it. We, I, th I think the potential is absolutely there. I think the question is when. So are there any devotees of uh, Milton Friedman out there, shareholder value, pure and simple? <laughs> Anyone want to tackle all this um, CSR stuff? <laughs> no? No skeptics? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Good morning, I'm Federico, Global Shaper from El Salvador. Uh, besides just changing a mission statement to uh, empower, or, or at least on paper, uh, this new purpose or newfound social purpose for all of, all of your companies, and I know Microsoft just hit refresh last year, changing its mission statement to a very bold one. What are some of the most effective strategies you have found to really make this a movement beyond every collaborator uh, and not, um, yeah, that would be my question. Beyond every collaborate, how do you really activate uh, uh, that willingness to really uplift that social purpose? What have been some of the most effective strategies? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start and feel free to, to jump in. I actually think you, you need to do two things. Number one, you need to be very public about what it is you, you intend to accomplish and be very specific about it, right? going out with slogans and things like that. And performance with purpose means a lot to us as a vision. But frankly, a, a skeptic could just say, oh, what is that? That's just another phrase. But then if you peel back behind it and look at all of the substance that's underneath it in terms of specific strategies, specific goals, specific time frames, building organizations to execute against that to, to the point made earlier, that, that to me is how you give yourself credibility that in fact these are the goals that lots of people care about and we get lots of feedback on them. The second thing you do is you have to talk about it constantly with your own organization. I will tell you, when, when we started this 10 years ago, you didn't have this rallying of support inside the company saying, yes, we now have it. It was more of a, okay, yeah, that sounds good, but, and sort of there was more of a, I need to focus on the day to day. But as we kept leaning into it and kept pushing and kept showing people why it was important and kept making the criteria for getting resources connected to the broader strategy of performance with purpose, not just I have a good financial return, that's when we started to get traction. 
Now we're at a point where I don't think the company would know what to do if it didn't exist any longer. And I will tell you from a recruiting perspective, people want to, especially as Mickey pointed out, young people want to come to a company that's not just successful, that doesn't just give them a paycheck, but gives them a reason to care about how they spend a big portion of their week, almost every single week. So that's how we've activated it. And as I said, I, it, to me, it's, it's fundamental to the company. It's intertwined into our DNA at this point. Tamsin, if I may, just one ad. Given the young people orientation, I don't think it's a slogan or a PowerPoint deck or an, even an email from the CEO. What we've seen, we actually have a, a division of BCG called Bright House that does purpose consulting. And what those guys do is incredible. It's the use of social media, it's video, it's multi, it's conversations. It's not static, and it's the consistency by which we communicate that, and we see that at the clients that do this very well. And the other piece is measuring, as the market, the PMI organization talked about. Those guys do is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for tweeting me already. <laughs> this is what I mean. No, so the, the consistency of follow through, it's like a, a financial KPI. How many people can recite it? How many of you all can recite your corporate purpose? And don't ask me to do it because we just changed ours. <laughs> That's all. The two ads, please. May, may. Hi, John Wolpert, uh, Chief of Awesomeness Seeker from uh, Consensus, the blockchain company. Um, Can I just salute you on your title? <laughs> seeker of Awesomeness, it's in my employment agreement. Um, yeah, uh, so th thank you, this is wonderful. The, 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 I think Yoda recently said uh, 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 the greatest teacher failure is. Um, how have you failed to, to uh, accomplish these goals that we've been dis discussing today? Again, can I ask if there is anyone in this room who is a skeptic on CSR? I mean, it, it would be quite telling if there isn't anyone at all. Does anyone want to, 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 to say that they, they think it's, you know, they think it's too fuzzy and ill-defined? No one, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, can, can we have, oh, oh, there's a lady over here, please. Well, I will try to go off to you, Tara Watt. I think uh, going, to ba going back to how uh, the market actually works and going back to your point about activist investors and uh, challenges of actually establishing those goals for the market and then, then delivering on them and connecting the financial goals with the CR go uh, um, uh, responsibility goals. That is our biggest challenge right now because at the end of the day, our stock price, our valuation, is measured by how well we perform financially. And responsibility goals are usually farther out. You don't see them until a couple of years later. And the immediate goals are the next quarter, the next two quarters. That's, that's the market. And if, that, if our stock price uh, plummets because the short-term goal is not met, we have a problem. So somehow we need to transition from the Friedman's economy and the way we measure, especially American-based companies, right? The companies that are traded on American stock market. We need to transition from the way we measure companies and truly integrate this metric into the way we value the company at the end of the day. That, that is my biggest concern. Thank you very much. So Hugh is the, the CFO of PepsiCo. Do you, I mean, you, we've had the Larry Fink letter, yeah. but then we've got Blackstone as well. You know, we've got, you know, the other side of the coin. So do you, do you think that the, there's a re meaningful kind of lengthening of the financial time horizon? I, I, I actually do because, I, and I actually don't think we need to change the way we measure it. I don't think we need to change the goals at all because, again, I'll, I'll, I'll go a little finance geeky on you. <laughs> the, the biggest value of the company is in the terminal value of the model, right? It's after year five, right? It's usually 70 or 80% of the value of the company. Even more in, in tech companies, it's like 150%. <laughs> so the notion of being just able to deliver for a couple of years and then, and then sort of having no place to go, it, doesn't, it, it won't create long-term value. Now, are there sets of investors who want to trade on the very short term and aren't worried about the long term? Without a doubt, there are. I mean, I'm, I'm not I don't have my head in the sand on all of that, which is why, to me, the challenge of management is how do you sufficiently deliver the short term in order to, and, and, and sufficiently deliver is defined to some degree based on the expectations you set, 
but to some degree based on the market that you're in and what you're reasonably capable of doing while doing the long-term stuff. My, my belief has always been most people can deliver the long-term relatively easily. Most people can deliver the short-term relatively easily. The real challenge of management and leadership is being able to do both. And a lot of that is just pushing yourself to try harder and to figure out how to sort of manage to do both. Now, sometimes if expectations have been set too high in the short term, yeah, those are, those are 30 problems to, to get out of. And sometimes if you don't have credibility as management with your investors, those are really thorny problems to get out of. But to the degree that you set expectations in the short term that you can deliver while investing in the long term, and then you sustainably do it, that's how you build the credibility to be able to do both. And that's, I know it, it, it's, it sounds simplistic, but the truth, and I don't mean to be overly reductionist about it, but the truth is that's really what it takes to manage it. Question about failures. I think it actually starts with where you are in terms of your starting point. There are many things that are done CSR wise that aren't working. And like innovation, sometimes those are you know, nice things to have, but you have to kill it early on in the funnel. And when that's not killed, it reduces the credibility of the good stuff that is happening. So, what we've seen of, of good examples and bad examples, the bad examples are the programs that stick around but aren't creating that value. Can we give and, an example of one? I well, I would say that killed off in the funnel? Well, I, in my personal experience, I can't speak for you know, what all my colleagues have seen, but I think if you have a 3G or somebody come in and you look at all the money that a corporation spends, you can actually itemize. What was the chairman's favorite charity? What was the thing that started in an emerging market that died because the GM moved then that initiative died? So it's actually very specific. And taking a hard-nosed look at the list of things that are already done we would posit as the beginning of figuring out your TSI or total societal impact strategy because if you don't know where you're starting from and how much money is going into those kind of activities, you wouldn't know what to kill and you wouldn't know what to double down on. And so I think it's that hard slope. So what, and I've done this before in terms of cost reduction work and looking at that line item. It's not a huge line item in corporate function, you know, cost and whatnot, but often it is something that has had a long legacy or a very short term initiative that just needed either a boost or a plan B. Yeah, just, just adding on that very quickly, the, the story I was talking about this TV white space initiative in the US started as a failure at Microsoft. We started seven, eight years ago. It was mostly a Microsoft research project, fantastic research, fantastic technology. What was missing was the business innovation. So basically finding a sustainable business model for entrepreneurship to make it work. And I think the third piece, which is always critical in all those projects, is the passion from your people. So if you align the technology innovation, the business innovation, and your people want to be part of that, I think you are something that actually can last and have a big impact. That's, that's really what's driving all of our people at the company now. It's not just the mission statement I was talking about. It's truly the way we walk the talk every day with the values we have and the way we apply empathy to many problems or opportunities we see in the world, working with our customers. So to me, that's really where things happen when you align all the power of your people, passion, value system of your company, the purpose you have in doing things that are naturally core of what you do every single day as a business. Thank you. With that, I'm afraid we, we need to end. Um, we've run out of time. So thank you so much, Jean-Philippe from Microsoft, Mickey from BCG, Jonathan from PayPal and Hugh from PepsiCo. Thank you very much indeed. And I also must, um, I really do want to mention again um, the support from the Brightline Initiative, BCG and PMI. Thank you. Um, please do t um, tweet away after this session. Tweet any thoughts that you had, any disagreements. Um, and there is actually, a, a, apparently there's a genuinely free lunch um, in a box in, and, a, and a smoothie available to sustain you for the, for the rest of the day. Thank you very much for coming. Everyone. Thank you, guys.